Welcome back to Inhibition. Today's topic is going to be a little bit different. We're going to break down a video from Steve Hofstetter, who's claiming to destroy every argument against gun control. I can tell you he doesn't do it. You're going to want to stick around for this. We're going to argue from everything about toddlers having weapons to making it more difficult for irresponsible people to have guns to gun confiscation and gun registries. You're not going to want to miss it. It's time we talk about it. Welcome back to the channel. So glad you guys are here. We're going to jump into this argument, but before we do, we release videos every week on conservative topics. If you're interested in that, hit that subscribe button, click that notification bell. It's time we talk about this. We're going to talk about gun control. We're going to break this down. Steve Hofstetter is claiming to destroy every argument against gun control in 15 minutes. I can promise you there is no way possible that anyone could actually do that. So he's lying, and we are going to destroy his arguments. So rather than destroying every argument against gun control, this is going to be destroying Steve Hofstetter. We're going to break this down point by point. Now, there's over 20 arguments he makes here. We're going to do the first six of them in this video, and then continue and do six more in another video, and we will continue on. So I'm excited to jump into this. Let's jump right into his video see what he has to say. And now, here are answers for every argument against gun control in one video. I have a stand-up clip where I talk about gun control, and every time I post it, I get the same two dozen asinine responses. Here goes. Number one, there should be no gun control at all. Okay, if you think there should be absolutely no laws when it comes to the regulation of firearms, that means it shouldn't be child endangerment to give one to a toddler. Arm the toddlers, like the Bill of Rights intended. But let's say you are one of the crazies who thinks that a two-year-old operating a firearm is perfectly fine. How about a recently paroled murderous sex offender who moves right next door to your daughter? Should that guy be allowed to own a gun? If you think that there should be exceptions for either of these or any other examples, then you admit that we should be able to reinterpret the Second Amendment for the time that we are currently living in. Number now this two. argument is what is called a straw man argument. He argues that people are claiming or are fighting against gun control by saying there should be no regulations on guns, no limitations, no laws, no rules, and no one is arguing that. We're going to look at in detail his argument here in just a moment, but I want to point out this is a straw man. That's why you see this straw man on my screen here. That's why you see this straw man on my screen here. A straw man argument is a form of argument and an informal fallacy. It is a logical fallacy of having the impression of refuting an argument, whereas the real subject of the argument was not addressed or refuted but is replaced with a false one. One who engages in this fallacy is said to be attacking a straw man. In other words, he's fighting a scarecrow. <laughs> a straw man argument is simply when you knock down a different argument than the one being made, but do it in a way where you pretend you're arguing against the real argument, and he's not. He is knocking down a false version of the argument. No one claims that there should be no laws at all. No one claims there should be no restrictions. We all agree there should be some laws, there should be some restrictions, and so giving a two-year-old a gun, no one is arguing that two-year-olds should have guns. As a matter of fact, if you look at his tweet that he throws up in that video, it doesn't even make this argument. He puts a tweet up, but that tweet doesn't even make the argument he's claiming that he's knocking down. We all agree there should be some laws or restrictions, but that does not mean you get to make up whatever laws and restrictions you want. You don't get to just say, okay, we all agree there should be some laws or restrictions. So that means open the floodgates and make all laws and restrictions. We don't care. So, what do you want to do now? The way I see it, we can do whatever we want. No, you don't get to say some laws and restrictions mean you get to make any law or restriction you want. Also, toddlers and violent felons uh, can't have guns because of them being demonstrably unsafe for others. A toddler, we know demonstrably, cannot physically handle a firearm and cannot rationally use their brain, scientifically we know this, to know when to shoot and when not to shoot, which is why toddlers cannot have guns. Violent felons have proven 
that they are violent and unable to legally and justifiably use a gun, and therefore they lose their rights to have guns. Those things are not the same as other people who are not toddlers who do have the full capacity of their brains as well as full physical ability to handle a firearm, nor have they given up their right to a firearm by showing that they are violent. So you cannot use these two extremes, toddlers and violent felons, and argue for the people in the middle. It does not work that way. Toddlers and violent felons are demonstrably unsafe for others. This actually goes to what I call the principle of limitation. This is something I talked about in a video I did on the Second Amendment. I'll link that video down in the description below. But there is a principle of limitation that says you do not get to infringe upon other people's rights and therefore the limitations that are rightly put onto your rights are only in such that your right infringes upon someone else. So for example, we have laws against murder. Why? Because my right to have a gun doesn't take away your right to life. I can't use my gun to take away your right to life. That would be an infringement on your right, and therefore that is a legitimate limitation. That is the principle of limitations. That does not mean you get to just make up whatever you want because we have some limitations. And then he says at the end, what does uh, he talks about if you think that toddlers shouldn't be able to have guns and violent felons shouldn't be able to have guns, then you understand that we must reinterpret the Second Amendment for our time. What are you talking about? Saying that toddlers can't have guns isn't a reinterpretation of the Second Amendment. From the very beginning, when the law was written, when the Second Amendment was put into place, they didn't let two-year-olds have guns. That wasn't something that was a thing. So this isn't reinterpreting anything. It's just continuing on with what's always been done. Same thing with violent felons. For even before the Second Amendment was written and then afterwards, there have been laws from the very beginnings that didn't let violent felons carry guns. They would lose their gun rights. That has been around since the beginning, since the Second Amendment was written. There is no reinterpreting of the Second Amendment to say that they can't have guns. That is not a valid argument, nor does it have anything to do with the Second Amendment or reinterpreting it. This is a straw man, and even his attempt to knock down the straw man doesn't work. Let's hear his next argument. Number two. The Constitution is absolute. No, it absolutely isn't. You know how I know? Because that is what an amendment is. It is the Constitution being amended. 27 times the United States has seen fit to fix something that the Constitution either left out or got completely wrong. In fact, the 18th Amendment was prohibition, and that was repealed by the 21st Amendment. But to get a bit more into the weeds, the first 10 amendments are commonly known as the Bill of Rights. That document was greatly influenced by one that preceded it by two years, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. If you haven't heard of that, that's because it's not an American document. It is a French Revolution document drawn up by Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson. The basic concept is that we all have unlimited rights until those rights infringe on the rights of someone else. And if you've never read or even heard of the document that the Bill of Rights is based on, I'm not going to accept your self-appointed expertise. Number now his arguments, again, just get ridiculous. First of all, this is a straw man argument for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you look at the tweet that he is responding to, they are actually not arguing that the Constitution is absolute. But let's address the argument that the Constitution is absolute. First of all, we need to define absolute because people use this term in different ways and when someone says the Constitution is absolute, there are a few possible meanings of what they are talking about. But I can tell you almost none of them where people say the Constitution is absolute has to do with the fact that the Constitution can't ever change and you can't amend the Constitution. So his argument about amendments has nothing to do with knocking down this actual argument. It is a straw man. Most people who use the phrase the Constitution is absolute or the Second Amendment is absolute or the right of the people to keep and bear arms is absolute, what they're referring to is one of two primary things. Number one, some people argue that the Constitution is absolute in its current written form, meaning that it is absolutely the law of the land and until you amend it, you cannot infringe upon it. In other words, if Second Amendment gives us the right to keep and bear arms and it shall not be infringed, if you don't like the Second Amendment, you still don't get to infringe upon my Second Amendment rights until you go through the process to amend it. So until you do so, it is absolute. That's one argument that people use. The other argument that people can use related to saying it is absolute is more in the sense of 
human rights. I have right. Really? <laughs> what do you think you are? I have right. So, for example, we believe in the freedom of religion, and we believe that that is a human right. You have a human right to freedom of religion. That right is not granted to you by the First Amendment. It is protected by the First Amendment. You already have the right because it is a human right. The same thing with the Second Amendment. When people say the Second Amendment is absolute, many of them are not referring to the fact that the Constitution can't change, that what they're saying is that it is a fundamental human right and no matter what the Constitution changes to, it's absolute in it, in being a human right. I have a right to life. You can change the Constitution all you want and try to pass an amendment that says I don't have a right to life, but I do have a right to life by nature of the fact that I am a human. Whether you like it or not, it is absolute. That's what people mean when they say it's absolute. They do not mean that the Constitution cannot change. But let's talk about the Constitution changing. Since he brought up the amendments, let's address them. He says that it has been amended 27 times, and technically that is true. 27 amendments are in the Constitution. That being said, out of those 27 amendments, the first 10 of those amendments actually were included as a part of the ratification process or as a guarantee for the ratification process when the Constitution was originally drafted. Now, again, it was they are amendments. They were not included in the original draft. But in order to negotiate ratification, to have the states ratify the Constitution, they felt, some states and some people felt, that there needed to be a Bill of Rights or some type of rights guaranteed in the Constitution so that the government could not overstep its boundaries. And therefore, the first ten amendments, which are the Bill of Rights, which he mentions, are included in the negotiation process and therefore actually kind of are attached along to the original constitution. Now, technically, they, the Ten Amendments were ratified about a year and a half later than, or, or about almost two years later after the ratification of the constitution itself. But again, they were proposed and discussed. Those particular rights were discussed with the original ratification of the document. So technically that leaves only 17 after that. But that means in over 200 years, we have only seen the need to change the Constitution 17 times. 17 times in over 200 years. If you only have to change this incredible document that governs our entire country 17 times in over 200 years, that is a pretty absolute document. Even though it does have an amendment process and we have amended it, that is a pretty absolute document to only have to be amended 17 times in over 200 years. Then he brings up the idea of the 21st Amendment repealing the 18th Amendment. So this is the only time that an amendment has been amended. So the none of the other amendments, once they were set in stone, the amendments were ratified, they were ratified. They weren't changed afterwards. The only amendment to be changed was the 18th Amendment. That is when it made it illegal to make, sell, or transport liquor. It was the Prohibition Era. And the 21st Amendment came in and repealed the 18th Amendment. So I want you to think about this. The only amendment to ever be amended was an amendment where they amended it to give a privilege back to the people. Not to take a privilege away, not to limit a privilege, but to give a privilege back to the people, to take away a limitation, not add a limitation. And that's just a privilege. What about the guaranteed right of the Second Amendment? So he wants to talk about it not being absolute and says, well, the Constitution has been amended 27 times. None of the first 10 amendments, which are in the Bill of Rights, have ever been amended. None of them have ever been changed. So to say that it's, oh yeah, it can change. Yes, technically it can. Is it likely to ever change? No, because the ratification process is extremely difficult. And especially with the polarization in our country now, you're unlikely to get the states needed to be able to amend it. But not only is it pretty absolute, but we have no, in our entire history as a nation, no evidence of any of the Bill of Rights 
being amended ever. And so, sorry, but this argument is incorrect. But that's just the argument about the amendments. Then he goes on to talk about this other French Revolution document, Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And I'm going to quote directly what Steve Hofstetter says. He says, the basic concept is we all have unlimited, unlimited, absolute unlimited rights until those rights infringe on the rights of someone else. This goes back to that principle of limitation I mentioned earlier. The basic concept is we have unlimited rights until those rights infringe on the rights of someone else. This completely decimates his entire argument and his cognitive dissonance to not recognize that and the absolute arrogance of him talking about this document as if, hey, I know the document it was based on and you don't, so I don't accept your expertise. That arrogance blinds him to seeing his own failure in his argument here. If we all have unlimited rights and those rights cannot be infringed until they, unless they infringe on the rights of someone else, then gun control is defeated because me owning a gun, no matter what type of gun, no matter if me owning a gun does not infringe on your rights, period. Irresponsible people who use it irresponsibly or criminally and do something, do commit a crime, they are infringing upon your rights with their guns. But me having a gun does not infringe on anyone's right. Me owning an AR-15 and having 30 round magazines does not infringe on your right. I am not using it to harm you. I am not doing anything to you. Me owning a gun in and of itself does not infringe on your rights. And therefore, by his own argument, we have the unlimited right to own it. So his own entire argument is destroyed. And he doesn't even see that he destroyed his own argument. All right. You really failed. You 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 failed, you failed, you failed, you failed, you failed. Let's look at number three. Number three. Why would we make it tougher for responsible people to own a gun? Because then it would also be harder for irresponsible people to own one. What a lot of anti-gun control people don't realize is the vast majority of the left doesn't actually want to get rid of guns. What we want is people who own them to be educated and responsible. Let's say you're in a situation with one of those good guys with a gun I always hear so much about, and I'll get to that fallacy later. You're just out shopping when suddenly a gun-wielding maniac grabs you. Thankfully, a good guy with a gun steps forward. Now, before that guy shoots, do you hope that he learned how to aim? So do I. Think of gun regulations like locking your door. Why bother to lock it when someone could still just smash your window? You lock your door because any deterrent, no matter how small, reduces the likelihood of a crime. Also, making it harder to own a gun actually rewards responsible gun owners by making it more of an exclusive club. You're welcome. Number so he starts this point off with saying that we should make it harder for responsible gun owners to get guns because it would also make it harder for irresponsible gun owners. In other words, punish the responsible gun owners because maybe if we cast wide enough net we'll get some of the irresponsible ones too. That is a terrible argument that he wouldn't apply to other things. For example, why not make it harder for responsible people to buy cars because that would make it harder for, harder for the irresponsible ones too who use cars dangerously. Or why not make it harder for responsible people to buy cleaning chemicals because that would make it harder for irresponsible people who buy cleaning chemicals who leave them out where children drink them and die from getting them too. Why not make it harder for responsible people to buy alcohol? Because that would make it harder for irresponsible ones too who drink and drive. Or maybe we should make it harder for responsible people to buy swimming pools because that would make it harder for irresponsible ones too who let their kids drown in a pool by not watching them. Do you see the flaw in this logic? We do not punish good people in the hopes that we catch some bad people too. That's not how America works. That's not how our justice system works. And that's not actual justice. You don't get to just say, well, there's some bad people. So I'm just going to cast wide enough a net of restrictions. Yeah, it'll hurt good people, but, you know, it stops some bad people, too. No, we don't get to do that, and we don't do that with anything else. 
You don't get to punish good, law-abiding, responsible people just because criminals exist. You don't get to do it. Absolutely not. Then he claims that the left doesn't want to get rid of guns. They just want people who own guns to be educated and responsible. And, and he doesn't, he uses this example about a good guy with a gun coming up to shoot someone in the head because they're trying to shoot the criminal. Don't you hope that they know how to aim? Yes, I hope they know how to aim. That has nothing to do with the government mandating any type of rules or laws. Most people with guns know how to use them. I know Steve, in his mind, thinks that gun owners are all just irresponsible people. He has in his head that most gun owners don't know how to use a gun and are just irresponsible. That is absolutely incorrect. Now, some don't, but most gun owners are responsible. We have millions upon millions of guns in this country, hundreds of millions, and we don't see hundreds of millions of people killed with guns ever because most people are responsible with their guns. But he says that the left doesn't want to actually get rid of guns. Well, that's not true, and he actually contradicts himself in this very video. But let's look at some people on Twitter who are on the left. These are just general Democrats or people on the left on Twitter. We're going to talk about later in this video politicians on the left who have clearly said they want to get rid of guns. But right now, let's just look at people who aren't politicians. Here's one where it says, repeal the Second Amendment, it's time. Here's one that says, we should repeal the Second Amendment and seize, not just, you know, ban them from being sold going forward, but seize all personal firearms. If you want to own one hunting rifle, you must fill an application, pass a test, and carry insurance. Here's someone that says, we not, we, not just you and I, but our society as a whole, have proven ourselves to be irresponsible to be trusted with guns. We need to repeal the Second Amendment. Here's someone that says, until we confiscate all guns, repeal the second, and disarm whites, this is a waste of time. Disarm whites. They want to literally use gun control based on race. That's racism. And disarm whites, confiscate all guns, repeal the second amendment. Here's someone that says, and literally no one needs to own a gun unless you're a farmer with livestock. People do want to get rid of the gun. People on the left absolutely want to get rid of guns. Steve is lying to you. He goes on to make an argument about how just a little small gun control is a deterrent, just like locking your door is a deterrent. What he fails to point out is that locking your door doesn't infringe on anyone's rights. Not only does locking your door not infringe on anyone's rights, Locking my door doesn't stop you from keeping your door unlocked or locking your own door. You still have that choice. Gun legislation that prohibits people from owning certain guns or makes it harder for people to own guns is infringing upon rights. And you passing that law to do that doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody, not just the one person locking their door. So no, it is not a valid comparison. But then he contradicts himself. He says, besides requiring only responsible gun owners to have guns and, and doing all these different things it says, he says, no, he says, no one wants to take away your guns. But then he says, we want it to be exclusive. It makes it an exclusive club. Wait, do you not want to take away the guns or do you want it to be exclusive? Because it can't be both. Because right now we have hundreds of millions of guns. It's not exclusive. So the only way to make it exclusive is to take away guns. He contradicts his own argument, and he does this repeatedly in this video. So no, he didn't destroy this gun argument either. Let's look at the next you're one. You're welcome. Number four, you're already required to register guns, except you're not. See, you're required to register some guns in some places, but 42 states, and we have 50 of those by the way, do not require mandatory registration. But if you did register your gun and you think that that's fine, well then you should support other people registering theirs as well. One more thing, we have no border checkpoints between states, so registration is pointless unless it is a federal searchable registry. And we don't have that. Number five. So this point was about a gun registry, and I'm just gonna simply say no. No! no. We do not need a federal gun registry. 
It's a very bad idea, which we'll get into in the very next point he raises as to why it is a bad idea. But I want to point something out. He makes the argument that he's defeating an argument against gun control. No one is arguing against gun control by saying we already have a register. The person who made that comment was likely responding to a specific situation, maybe in a specific state, or a specific situation based on their lack of knowledge that it's not federal because they live in a state that has a gun registry. But this is not an argument against gun control. Anti-gun control advocates are not running around saying, hey, but we already have a registry. That's not something that's argued for. As a matter of fact, anti-gun control advocates argue for the exact opposite of not having a registry. So I promise you, this is not a gun control argument he has debunked. And no, we don't need a federal gun registry. Let's listen to his next point, and then I'll explain it. Number five. Gun registration leads directly to confiscation. What a hilariously untrue statement. Let's start with Canada. In 1995, Canada passed the Firearms Act, mandating registration. Yet Canada still has the eighth most guns per capita of any country at 34.7%. The people who say that Canada confiscates guns are either wrong or lying. Even with a new strict proposed bill that has not yet passed, buyback is still voluntary. Finland has a gun registry and they're at 32.4% guns per capita. Australia, the United Kingdom, Bangladesh, Costa Rica, Iceland. There are over a hundred countries that require owners to register guns that haven't confiscated them. Have any regimes confiscated guns? Sure, it's possible, but to argue that it's inevitable shows a complete misunderstanding of statistics. So this is the argument as to why we should not have a gun registration. Gun registration can lead to confiscation. Now, before we jump into his specific examples and specific countries, I want to point out his misrepresentation of the argument. The argument isn't that it absolutely 100% will lead to confiscation. It's that it can and gives the ability for confiscation. In other words, the argument isn't that if we register guns, they're going to confiscate your guns tomorrow. The argument is that if we have a national registry, the government will then have the capability of confiscating all of the guns. The issue isn't the guarantee of a confiscation, but rather the ability of one. So he's kind of arguing against the wrong thing here. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? But let's talk about his specific examples. He talks about Canada. First of all, what he fails to mention is while they are eighth on the list of guns per capita, they used to be higher. They used to have more guns. The guns indeed have been taken away. There are many guns that are banned and people who had them had those guns confiscated. So to say that it never led to a confiscation, he's just lying to you. But on top of that, he mentions the current legislation that has not passed yet it actually at least at the time of that recording had not passed it actually is something that is moving forward in canada trudeau has basically signed it into law and it just hasn't gone into effect but this gun law will create a voluntary buyback that is being labeled currently as voluntary could potentially become mandatory but what he doesn't mention in his argument is that the legislation also allows municipalities to ban handguns through bylaws restricting their possession, storage, and transportation. Trudeau said the measures will be backed up with serious penalties to enforce these bylaws, including jail time for people who violate the municipal rules. That comes from globalnews.ca. I'm pointing this out because while a federal uh, mandated buyback is not happening in Canada, the local municipalities will have the ability to pass legislation to ban handguns through their bylaws. And if they do that, their possession of those guns will be considered a crime, including jail time, and those guns will have to be confiscated. So to say that it doesn't lead to confiscation in Canada is a complete lie. He also mentions Australia. Australia absolutely had a confiscation. It's from Vox.com. Australia solved the problem by introducing a mandatory, not voluntary, mandatory buyback, which is a gun confiscation. They would take away all guns that had just been declared illegal in exchange. They paid the gun owners a fair price. Look at the last sentence of that last paragraph. 
about 650,000 legally owned guns were peacefully seized, then destroyed as part of the buyback. Peacefully seized. It was a mandatory back buyback. 650,000 guns. So, yes, Australia had a confiscation. So what are you lying about, Steve Hostetter? He talked about New Zealand. There was a gun registration in New Zealand passed in 1920 with the Arms Act of 1920. As of 2019, more than 19,000 firearms have been surrendered to the government because of the legislation banning those semi-automatic weapons. They also went after parts, magazines, and ammunition that could be used to assemble a prohibited firearm. Yes, there was a confiscation in New Zealand. Why didn't he mention Cuba? Cuba took away the guns. There was a confiscation after a registration. Let's hear what this lady from Cuba actually has to say about it. This is a really good comment, and I want to uh, I wanna talk about a little bit of, of Cuban history related to this, okay? Because 62 years ago, Cuba was just as free as America was. We used to have the right to have weapons. We were just like America, okay? Fidel came along, and as soon as he took power, the first thing he did was to take account of every weapon that there was in the country and who it belonged to. Once he finished that task and he had a complete data of every single bullet and gun that there was in the country, he went ahead and impounded for the people, leaving an entire country without arms. Only the army has weapons in Cuba and that's why the people don't do anything. So, from personal experience here, this woman talks about Fidel coming into power, immediately taking account of all the guns, determining where all the guns are, creating a, a registry, and then he took the guns. Yes. Is it possible to have a registration and confiscation never happen? Yes. But the possibility is the problem. The problem isn't the guarantee. Oh, it guaranteed it will happen. The problem is the possibility. If I say, if you walk through that door, there is a one in 10 chance that you will be shot and killed. It's not a guarantee, but it's a one in 10 chance. Will you walk through the door? Of course not, why? Because it isn't the guarantee that is the issue, it's the possibility. That's the problem. Let's hear his next argument. Number six, the government would confiscate all guns if they could just get away with it. That is a story I've been hearing for decades. The Democrats were coming for your guns back in 2008 when Barack Obama got elected, except that was 13 years ago. Back then, the Democrats held the presidency, the House of Representatives, and a filibuster-proof supermajority in the Senate. Did they come for your guns then? No, weird. The only laws on the books that enable confiscation are red flag laws. Those are passed at the state level, and they require both a red flag and red tape to decide individually if someone is no longer competent to own a firearm. The state with the most confiscations under their red flag law is actually Florida, and they can't even confiscate in most counties unless the owner agrees to it. And even then, Florida, the state that leans on red flag laws the most, sees confiscations at the rate of fewer than one per 10,000. There is absolutely no boogeyman going from house to house confiscating your guns. Red flag laws aren't frequently used, and they're even less frequently misused. If your argument is red flag laws, then your argument is a red herring. Numbers and now he argues about them coming for your guns, about confiscation, red flag laws. We'll talk about red flag laws specifically in just a moment. But he argues here that they are not coming for your guns, that, that this is just a boogeyman that's coming to your door to door to go to gather your guns. First of all, nobody's claiming they're going door to door. So again, that's part of a straw man argument. But on top of that, he says they're not coming for your guns, just flat out. That Obama, you know, was supposedly supposed to be coming for your guns, and he didn't. That's not actually true. He did attempt to come for our guns. Even with a fully Democrat Congress, and he still could not get it passed, but he did indeed attempt to come for our guns. Let me briefly describe the legislation we're introducing. We prohibit 158 specifically named military style firearms. Our bill also prohibits other semi-automatic rifles, handguns, and shotguns that can accept a detachable magazine 
and have one military characteristic. Except the bill didn't pass, and the reason for it is because they couldn't get the votes. Why couldn't they get the votes? Well, let's see what Obama has to say about it. Public opinion does not demand change in Congress. It will not change. We have, uh, I've initiated over 20 executive actions to try to tighten up some of the rules mm -hmm. and the laws. But the bottom line is, is that uh, we don't have enough tools right now uh, to really uh, make as big of a dent as we need to. So yes, Obama did attempt to come for our guns. And then our current president, which was Obama's vice president, Joe Biden, current president, said, that he was absolutely coming for our guns. Here is Joe Biden explicitly making that claim. So to, to, to gun owners out there who say, well, a Biden administration means they're gonna come for my guns. Bingo, you're right if you have an assault weapon. The fact of the matter is they should be illegal, period. Then he argues about red flag gun laws. Now we'll talk about red flag gun laws in a moment, but first he says that it's something that only happens on the state level. Yet he completely ignores the fact that our current president is arguing to have red flag gun laws on the federal level. Here is Joe Biden making that claim. I want to see a national red flag law. So not only is this a state problem, but it is also looking to be eventually a federal problem per the desires and wishes of the current president. And then he says they're not coming for your guns. But he admits that red flag gun laws are confiscation. He explicitly calls it confiscation. And it doesn't matter that it's a few amount, right? The argument that it's, well, it's only happening to a few people right now. It's not a big deal because it's only a few people right now. That's irrelevant. First, it is a confiscation, no matter how small. And second, the issue is possibility. If it is on the books that you can take my guns and confiscate them, if that is a law that is legally allowed in this country without due process, just take my guns, then though it is currently being used in a very small way, that means that it is possible for someone to abuse that and take them away on a large scale. You do not get to say that because it hasn't happened on a large scale yet, that it never will. That is fundamentally illogical. You have to acknowledge that the gun law itself allows for large scale confiscation, not just small scale. So even though it's only small scale right now, that doesn't mean it won't become large scale. And the problem is the fact that it has the potential to do so. That's the argument against gun control. That's not the argument that he addresses here. So that's the first six arguments in this video. All of them are completely terrible arguments. Not one time in that entire video so far has he actually destroyed a gun control argument or an argument against gun control. His entire time he has been arguing against straw men and engaging in logical fallacies. His arguments are terrible. We'll continue on and talk more about this in part two. Don't miss it. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. For more videos, click subscribe and hit that notification bell. And if you enjoyed the video, click that like button. See you next time.